What is a complete human? Is it a cover model? Is it a science geek? Is it a fitness expert? Or all of the above and more? Jana and Evan are crusaders that walk the earth looking at today's issues that touch our hearts and minds. The honest and hopeful outlook on the advancement of today's society. The science behind the decay of human relationships. The necessary preparations for future generations. Join us as we look deep inside ourselves and embark on a journey into becoming a complete human. Hey, hey, everyone. Evan DeMarco here. I don't know about you, but I often struggle to eat enough vegetables. I know they are good for me, and I even enjoy the taste of some of them. But yet somehow veggies always seem to be in short supply on my dinner plate. And don't get me started on trying to get my seven-year-old daughter to eat her veggies. That's one of the reasons I created Organic Greens. While it doesn't replace veggies, the 79 superfoods, veggies, vitamins, minerals, and pre and probiotics help get my daughter and me closer to that optimal intake level. And the best part, it tastes great. Complete Human Organic Greens is a delicious daily drink mix that we both look forward to. And as a parent, it's something that I feel great giving my daughter. Make sure to check out Organic Greens at store.completehuman.com and use code EVAN30 to save 30% off your first order today. That's store.completehuman.com with code EVAN30 to save 30% today. So we are back with Valentine Thomas. Yeah. I want to say Valentine, but it's Valentine. Um, so in French it's Valentine, and then in English it's Valentine. Oh. I just I don't know. I kind of <laughs> like Valentine. Okay. Uh, Jenna was going to sing my funny Valentine just to serenade you. <laughs> Here's what I've been trying to figure out. Like one of my favorite jokes of all time is, what do you call a thousand lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. I don't know. Okay. And that's an American joke, usually, you know, kind of berating lawyers. But now all of a sudden we've got a lawyer at the bottom of the ocean and this really is a good start. So uh, kind of talk to us a little bit about your journey from being a lawyer to being a spear fisher woman. It was um, very um, coincidental. Um, coincidental. Sorry, I speak French. Uh, <laughs> we can do the whole thing in French. In French. <laughs> So basically, I just decided to, I moved to London in 2010, and um, I started working there for a little while, and then I did um, a second master when I got there to kind of do my conversion class, and I just weirdly stumbled across a new group of friends who were all doing spit machine, which is very weird in London, um, yeah. and then they dragged me to actually go do a class, which I did not want to do in the slightest because I was petrified by the water. But um, I decided to go anyway, and then, so I did my little freediving class, and then I was, I was, you know, I liked it, but I wasn't like, this is life changing, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but then we went spearfishing a couple of months after, and that changed my life. <laughs> really? So what happened? It was, um, oh, I was so scared. It was terrible. Um, we get to this island, which is called Ascension Island, and then to get there, you need to take a military plane from a military base um, just off London. So we get there and then my friends are telling me, okay, so we have two hours and then we're gonna go out at sea. I've never spearfished before. They explained it to me that we have to go like 30, 40 miles offshore. So I get on the boat, everybody jumps in the water. I'm in the back of the boat, I'm shaking. <laughs> I'm like, why am I here? <laughs> like that. <laughs> So then I decide to, okay, I'm like, I'm going to come down. My heart is pumping in my chest like crazy. And then I just decide to jump into the water. And then as I jumped into the water, everything just became super nice and beautiful. It was fish everywhere. And it was not at all what I expected, so especially that the weather was so bad that day. You know when it sees like black on top and there were big waves and then underwater, everything was super beautiful. Um, and then that day I shot my first fish. Um, it was a pretty big one, actually. It was... Um, about 12 kilos, which is 24 pounds. pounds, about 24 pounds and um, not a good fish to eat, <laughs> but <laughs> because it was mine, because I caught it, it was one of the best meal I ever had. Mm -hmm. And then this is kind of when I discovered, okay, so first of all, um, I'm a tiny little girl who grew up being scared of her own shadow her whole life. And then I'm discovering that I have a hunting instinct and that there is an entire new world out there that 
I really, really have to discover. And then I love food. Food is my biggest passion by far. And um, so I was like, okay, I can actually go get in the water and catch anything I want to make amazing meals. So that's what got me. <laughs> nice. Wow. So then you come back to London and then what? How do you transition from this, you know, sitting in an office, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wearing business suits to, you know, changing into swimsuits every day is kind of your, uh, is your wardrobe. So it, it, it took a few years because all of a sudden I didn't want to go on holiday in Ibiza or in all of those party places anymore. All of a sudden I just wanted to go spearfish somewhere remote and just my, my, my life changed, uh, my life changed completely. And my, my, my interests was, were completely different than what it were before. And a few years later, I think about five years later, um, I was hired to film a documentary in South Africa. And then I was paid barely anything for that. But then I came back and I was telling myself, wait a minute, I can be paid to do cool stuff in life. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that exists. <laughs> so that's kind of when every time I was at work, my mind was just drifting away. I was just finding myself just researching everything about spearfishing and what can I do? You're not going to make money out of it. And then I decided to take a step back. Um, I went to Tanzania for five weeks. I live in a little fishing village. I wore no shoes and a bathing suit for the entire time. And then I was just kind of realizing that I, I worked so hard for where I was and I had a really big apartment. I had a brand new Mercedes. I had everything that I've kind of ever worked for. And then also then I was kind of finding myself in this environment where nobody gave a shit with shoes I was wearing. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> I still have my shoes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, so I was like, okay, so this is really when I realized that I was working towards the wrong things in life. And then I really needed to, to, to make a change. And yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I still have very high, uh, very big ambitions to what I want to achieve, but I want to do it on my terms and on things that makes me happy. And then for different reasons. Hey, hey, everybody, Evan DeMarco here. Most of you have heard about CBD over the last couple of years, and as one of the most successful product formulators in the CBD marketplace, I am intimately familiar with what it can and cannot do. With everything from miracle cures for cancer, to regrowing hair, to improving sex, the claims around CBD have been fanciful, if not completely false. You see, CBD is a great product, but it does have a very indirect impact on our bodies. That is why I was excited to create a product that uses some of the novel phytocannabinoids directly from our USDA certified organic farms right here in the US. These novel cannabinoids like CBC and CBG have been proven to have a direct impact on our bodies, especially for things like stress, anxiety, and pain. But that wasn't enough. I wanted to make the very best product for our customers. So I created a unique lipid delivery system to rapidly increase bioavailability. I also added a few extra goodies like beta caryophylline to really help with pain and recovery. CBC Plus is the next generation of phytocannabinoid products for the complete human. So head over to completehumancbc.com to get your bottle today. That's completehumancbc.com. Are you still practicing law? No, I'm not. Okay. I'm very happy I have my degree and my master, but um, I was I could never go back to a I have a boss and b sitting at a desk all day long. <laughs> Wait, I feel like we can relate. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think you're definitely part of the club, and that's why you know, kind of stumbling across you, it was like, okay, you're you're part of the complete human family. You don't know it yet, but you're part of the complete human family. So, okay, so you go to South Africa, you film this documentary, you're five weeks in Tanzania, and then somehow you have been able to, you know cash in the Mercedes, the big apartment, you know, put the, put the Louis, uh, Christian Louis Vuittons in the, in the storage or wherever they're at and then travel the world. But how have you managed to actually turn that into a career? So it took, it took a lot of work. Um, of course, at first I was like, I'm available, please call me. Um, <laughs> of course yeah. that doesn't work. Um, in the slightest. So <laughs> It was really kind of about um, kind of realizing, okay, so what do I want to achieve? Make a plan and then just work as hard as I can to, to, to make that happen. And for the last five years, I've been, every time I've been making money, I've been reinvesting it in my company and try to, to push to go forward. And it's been about a year now that I have 
enough money to make an actual living. I've been pretty broke the last years, but... (laughs) Yeah, but but how how amazing is that transition though to finally be aligned with something that truly speaks to you and then make a living off of that? I mean, it's I think that's the goal everyone works works hard for if they can. And it's amazing when we can find those things that we finally can make a living off of what we're passionate about. Of course, and also you know even in the moments where I was really at my lowest, like when I was living in my car and when I had mm-hmm. literally three dollars in my bank account, it was this this freedom that I have, this, this just that I can do pretty much anything. I can wake up by the beach if I wanted to. And it was really this, this aspect of be able to do whatever I wanted. Well, that was free. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, it was, this is kind of also what I love about that. As I'm not a morning person. So for me to be able to wake up as late as I want and then work when I want, then this, this, this is, that was really life changing. So did your friends and your family think you were completely off the reservation? Oh, they thought I was absolutely mental. Uh, <laughs> they were like, why are you doing that? This is not a job. Like, you need a good position. You should, like, keep doing that. You're going to regret it. But, hey, who's laughing now? <laughs> right. And you, I think I, I heard that you speak at a lot of women empowerment um, events or groups. What What is your message to women? I mean, is it is it own who you are, do what you want to do, regardless if it's aligned with other people's beliefs. And like, what is your core message to these women? There's two things. Um, The first thing is you can do so much things, uh, so much more things, sorry, than you think you can do. Again, I grew up, I had very severe panic attacks for a very long time. Um, I was scared of everything and I didn't have any self-confidence. I started from very, very low on a lot of points. And it's just, I just kind of, by putting myself outside of my comfort zone, I really discovered that I was much stronger than I thought I was. And it was, it was kind of a bit of, without wanting to sound cheesy, it was kind of a bit of revel- revelation, sorry for me, because I was like, oh, I'm actually not a big wuss. I'm actually way stronger than I thought I was. And then by facing those situations, then, you know, I was, I got lost at sea uh, in Mexico. I almost got chewed on by a shark several times and then situations that if you told me 10 years ago I would be like there's no way I would freak out that I would I could never uh react in a good way and then again by putting yourself in those situations then when you don't have a choice to be badass you will be one (laughs) (laughs) that's a that's a great point yeah uh that's the first one (laughs) but then the second oh sorry sorry. go ahead please and then the second one that's very important is that I'm I'm Again, I'm, I'm, I'm a girl. I have a very feminine side to me. And I found that people really try to put me in a box very often. Uh, so the whole side that, oh, she's just a bimbo with a bikini. Or on the other side is, ah, oh, no, uh, like there's no way she can like anything that, I don't know, like fashion related, anything like that. Because, oh, she touches that fish. So there's no way she can be that. So it's, it's kind of understanding that, you know, you don't have to be one person. You can be different things and there's not there's no problem with that it's again I love wearing dresses I love wearing heels I love everything that I have and at the same time I love going camping in a bush in Africa and not showering for a week I'm having fun while doing that <laughs> now did any of those thoughts that people were thinking or the, th- the things that you heard oh she's just a this she's just a that did any of that get to you did, did any of those things actually permeate your mind and prevent you from moving forward in the way that you wanted to um, I, I, I would lie if I would say no. Um, of course, you know, when that brands are telling you like, oh, no, you, 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 you kind of too much of a bikini chicks for us. I'm like, what? I can dive 170 feet. Like, who's, who's, how, how can I too much of a bikini chick for you? But it's I think it's just a perception that that needs to change. But it's it's really hard, especially when I worked so hard to be where I was and I trained so hard to, to be able to be the diver that I am today that. Sometimes it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, so just just go, go, sorry, just, yeah, it's not very fun to be diminished that way, but mm-hmm. there's always somebody to complain about something anyway, so I have to learn how to pass up with that. <laughs> so true. So you, you, you have a, or your record is 170 feet, right? Yes, free diving. That's insane. So that, that's actually holding your breath, right? Yes. So I, I don't really train free diving. I train more for spirit. That's so cool. 
So you've, you've traveled the world. You, you know, we saw your TED talk where you, uh, you know, you, you talked a little bit about being face to face with a tiger shark. Um, what's kind of been your most harrowing experience underwater? Um, there's so many little moments that happen where I was really like, oh, why did I pick to do that with my life? Uh, <laughs> but it's again, every time that something happened was because I disregarded, I disregarded a safety uh, measure. So it's kind of my fault. And then it was just about, yeah, kind of it's in the ocean. You cannot be cocky. You can, you have to stay humble the whole time because Mm -hmm. the sea can change in an instant and it can put you in a very dangerous situation, um, very, very quickly. So that tiger shy situation is a good example of that because, um, we were in 15 feet of water. Everybody was very experienced divers. So we just thought you always have to be two when you spearfish. It's, it's a team sport. And um, so, again, because everybody was experienced, everybody just kind of scattered around because, I, I, you know, the check needs, you know, shallow water. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. And then next thing I know, there's a tiger shark really charging me with his battle a bit nonstop. <laughs> And I'm freaking out in the water. I'm screaming to my friend to come help me. They're too far away to hear me. And at some point, so the shark rolled his eyes back. It was just when they're ready to 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 eat or attack something. So they protect their eyes before they do that. Mm. So this is when I was like, oh, shit, this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is bad. I was like, okay, well, you know what? I had a good run, but <laughs> I think this is the end of it. Um, and my friend kind of arrived right at that moment. And... So they don't really like when you're too, they're a little bit more cautious. So then, of course, at that moment, he circled a couple of times and he left. But my heart was pumping so hard. And um, so, yeah, I have, I have so many stories like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I would have wet myself, which I guess if you're underwater, nobody can tell. <laughs> well, the problem is that you don't have a choice because when the shark is charging you, you cannot have a weak moment because, first of all, this is a predator and we're also a predator. And you cannot act like a prey. So you're going to have to look at the shark and you, do, you don't have a choice than to, to stay in your stance and then look at the shark and look at a predator. And you have to have a presence. And when you know that this is your only chance of survival, you're not going to think about anything else mm-hmm. because you don't have a choice. And again, it was, it, when you don't have a I, choice. <laughs> and, and it's funny because you, you said that on, on Joe Rogan's podcast where, you know, I think human beings have come to believe that they're the top of the food chain, that we're the apex predator, and we're really not. No. And, and I guess you get to, you kind of get to experience that firsthand all the time, you know, whether it's underwater or in the jungles of Africa, it's, it's you've seen, you know, firsthand that, that we are not the top of the food chain. We're just kind of arrogant enough to think we are. Mm-hmm. Especially in the water, because, you know, when you put yourself in the water, you're giving up on your speed, you're giving up on your strength, you're giving up on, on, you know, easy body movement. So you're kind of giving up of everything that makes you a good predator in a way. So it's, it's, yeah, it's very humbling. And again, you really have to learn how to take your place and not feeling too cocky about it. Oh, yeah, I... we, we definitely have to respect nature and every, I mean, even the ocean itself is a scary place. Anything can happen out there. Um, did you have a question? I, I was oh, no, like... I just reminded me of being in a cage, you know, around great whites. And then, you know, you're just like, you, you're so humbled by that. You're like, I, I have no power in this situation whatsoever. Yes, exactly. And it's, and the water, if a shark wants to eat you, he's going to eat you. There's nothing you can do about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. First, you won't see it coming. And then there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. Right. <laughs> so, so I have a question. So Evan and I highlight a lot of social responsibility and sustainability. And that's something that we're passionate about. And we love to share those stories. And I, I have a question about spearfishing and that sustainability side. What What is the connection there? So... I get a lot of backlash because, again, I, I do an act of killing uh, a living creature. So, of course, that bothers a lot of people. Sadly, a lot of people that are bothered with that also buy a fillet of cod at a grocery store. Um, it's Is it unpleasant to, to kill something? Yes. Um, I, I don't take any pleasure out of it. I do love the whole spearfishing aspect of it in the sense that I love being in water. I love seeing dolphins and sharks and whales and rays and a bunch of amazing things around me. Um, so I, I love my dive for that, but I, I don't like uh, pressing the trigger in a fish. It's, 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 it's hard for me, but I eat fish and I consume seafood and I'd much rather be in the water um, 
and pick exactly what I want. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes paper shilling the most sustainable way to consume seafood because you get to respect seasons, you get to pick the size of the fish, um, you get to pick the species. And then I, I specialize a lot in um, spear fishing for trash fish. Uh, <laughs> my friends are making fun of me because I like to take fish that nobody likes and then cook them and making it to something really, really good. So it's, what's, an, what's an example of a trash fish? Um, I only have Florida species in mind, but like a white market, for example, that most people think it's gross and it's just about making it better. Even when I I have a big fish, my favorite parts, I do, I keep the ribs, I keep the collars, I keep the head and I just try to, to cook everything. And it's, yeah. (laughs) That's good though. Cause we, we spoke to, um, Dr. Paul Saladino, and he's the the carnivore doctor. He promotes a carnivore diet, and but but what he says is eating nose to tail. It's not just you know the some some like some just one muscle of the animal. It, it's eating literally the whole entire thing and not letting any of it go to waste because there is you know valuable nutrients in in those parts as well. Um, it's the same so, with the fish. You can eat the liver. You can eat the roe. And I'm not sure if I can say that in your podcast, but you can eat the milk also from a male fish. Oh, like the semen? Yeah. The milk. <laughs> I had to, I was like, oh, the milk, like, but I was like, wait, isn't it just the, the female mammals that <laughs> have milk? Yes. And I was like, wait a minute, the male milk so must be semen. I just went through all of that in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes like foie gras. It's very good. It, it tastes t- like what? Like foie gras. Seriously? Good. Yeah. Like what? Foie gras. It's like go- uh, like goose liver. Oh, I had that for the first time with you. Yes. Well, okay. Now here's the problem. So that uh, <laughs> we love that, but now I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to eat fish milk to taste that. I'm gonna it process kind of- this one. Well. Okay, I mean, I, I don't want to push it here, but it's just kind of like melt in your mouth type of texture, and it's, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, no judgment here. I thought I was the weird one for like, you know, Thanksgiving and stuff. I always would fight my mom over the heart and the liver and like all the other <laughs> organs that people are typically like, ew, disgusting, don't even touch. I'll try anything once, so I actually find that really fascinating. I, I'd want, right. I'd try it eventually. Uh, how do we find fish <laughs> semen? Okay, well, next time I go fishing and I come back to California, I will bring you both fish semen. <laughs> Perfect. You know, uh, no, because if you live in Florida, I'd rather just come to you where the weather's warm and we can go out on a boat and you can show this. I mean, you know, it, it's funny. I watched the, the boat burger uh, thing that you guys did on YouTube. Oh, yeah. It, that it, was fun. It was so much fun to watch you guys, you know, like, you know, catch the squid and use that as bait and then, you know, get the fish and then like actually turn that into something. So kind of coming back to what she said about ocean conservation is, you know, you've got these giant fisheries out there, you know, taking all sorts of stuff out of the ocean. You know, you've got the bycatch, which can be the dolphins. You've got all this. So clearly spearfishing is a sustainable, uh, it's a sustainable act and there's something beautiful in that. So why is it outside of just killing a fish that people are so against that when clearly it's sustainable over commercial fishing? I think that people are very emotional when it comes to to those type of issues these days. And the problem is that being emotional about that kind of makes you part of the problem because it's it's it, there's nothing wrong with feeling bad for an animal. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just you know it's a compassion that's it's, it's, it's again it's beautiful to have, but the problem is that it creates kind of a, a, an obliviousness to, to what's happening. And then this is not helping. Um, you need to know what's happening. You need to know how your fish got there. You need to know how your meat got there. Then this is how you can actually pressure company and make better decisions as a consumer. So it's, there are difficult discussions, but we need to have them. And then we need to look at, 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 at what's happening behind the curtain. And Sally, if you're like, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, but then you still buy that fish at the grocery store, then again, it's 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 kind of and it's no different from beef, you know, or or anything, right? It's you know, we, you know, I think so many people were up in arms on those documentaries, um, super size, not super size me. What was the one? um, Calspiracy. Yes, and 
you know, it, it, it's like when you when we look behind the curtain of what happens to get that food product to our grocery store and then buy it, it's like people freak out. But you know, they're willing to criticize you for spear fishing while they're eating their hamburger from McDonald's. It's it's mm-hmm. insanely hypocritical. Right. Well, it's actually funny you mentioned that discussion because uh, that documentary because I, I had a chat with um with the guy who um who made that documentary because I found out that he was working on a documentary called Fish Piracy. Um. Mm. So I contacted him and said, look, like I have a lot of insights, you know, I travel to a lot of fisheries and I think there's a lot of good points that, you know, if you want, I can, I can help you. Um, and he told me that he refused my help because I kill fish and fish are friends. Seriously. So it's, there's just different part of the, the spectrum here that again, those are discussions that we need to have and we need to have them with an open mind because I respect uh, vegans. I respect, you know, with the decisions that they're making, but then if you just like, no, 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 I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear you're a terrible person. Then you're not, you're not helping. And mm-hmm. I met with uh, last year um, with Paul Watson from Sea Shepherd. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, I tried to have a discussion with him and I tried to explain him, you know, the beauty behind spit fishing and how, you know, like how, even though we're doing very differently that you know, we fight for the same mission. And he was rather unpleasant. About it. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's, yeah, it's just about again. We need everybody on the spectrum of 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 of, um, of both sides needs to have an open mind when we discuss that type of issues. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think education, and and I think back to you know my six year old daughter. One of her favorite movies is Moana, and I, I think back from an anthropological perspective, we're you know we're kind of a sea or close to a seafaring species. Fish is a predominant dietary staple in our in our history. We didn't have boats to go out and catch, you know, you know, catch with nets. So people have been spear fishing or fishing since the dawn of time. Why does that have to change? And why is there a problem with that? Especially if we're not going into some of these deep waters, um, pulling a lot of these fish out that don't need to be pulled out because we can fish coastally and still preserve the, you know, the entire fish species. And, and we spoke to Dr. Enric Sala on that one. And his whole thing, another TEDx speaker on this was like, why do we have to go to the high seas to fish? We can do it, uh, you know, close to shore and preserve the high seas uh, for some of the, you know, the fish that most people don't even eat anyway. Um, that's, in my opinion, a little bit unrealistic. Um, the problem is that, so we're billions of people depending on seafood as a primary source of protein. So that creates a problem. Um, same thing now with, with uh, farming. Um, you know, there's a lot of backlash when it comes to fish farming, but it accounts for almost 50% of the fish consumption in the world. We do need to step back a little bit on our fish consumption, yes, but to only fish uh, fish on the shore, there's, uh, there's not enough. Great point. That's a very great point. So is so what's the solution outside of everybody grabbing a, you know, grabbing yeah. a spear and heading to the water? Um, that's, I mean, you're probably not going to like that, but fish, fish needs to be a little bit more expensive, um, because of the burden of sustainability, it cannot be put on, uh, poor people. You cannot say a fisherman living in a remote, um, island that he needs to only eat sustainable fish because it's going to tell you to go screw yourself and it's going to be very right about it because, you know, he has nothing else to eat. Um, he's got to feed his family. Yes. And then on the other side, you cannot also tell, you know, Susan with single mother with six kids that she needs to only buy the sustainable salmon if she wants to feed uh, fish to her kids. So it's 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 it's, a, it's not a black and white question. It's a, it's a big gray area when it comes to this. There's a lot of issues. Um, I would say that um, the kind of monopole that China is creating right now in seafood is also becoming an issue. Um, but there is a lot of good work that's being done and sustainability of, of the fisheries. There, it's definitely moving forward. There's a lot of flaws still, but it's definitely going in the right direction. And I actually do not believe that by 2050, the ocean is going to be empty. Really? You don't believe that? You think there's no. there's hope? Yeah. Yes. And this ice pan. So basically when I started spearfishing, when they're very red, I, I don't buy seafood now, but at the beginning, when I kept buying seafood, I was just wondering, okay, so but when am I supposed to buy? Because I, I don't know. And because I started diving, you know, it created that proximity that created um, that created the, 
care for the ocean. So of course I wanted to buy in the, in the correct way. And then I realized there's no information for the public. We have no clue what to get. There's a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of like sustainably sourced, but then you'd have no clue why is it sustainably sourced and who said that. Um, so that's kind of why it became a little bit of my mission to be able to fill that gap between consumers and um, and the fisheries or any other entities. And it was really about, yeah, that's what I use my platform um, a lot for. So are there things that consumers can look for if they want to support sustainable fishing so that we aren't, you know, barren seas by 2050? Um, a good start is eco labels. It's not perfect. It's far from perfect, but it's a good start. Okay. So if you have a choice between a fish that's certified and a fish that's not certified, I would definitely go for uh, the certified fish. Or if you can encourage smaller like family boat and smaller fisheries, that's also, but it's, people need to do research. I know it's a lot of work and, you know, we're all busy with life, but um, yeah. So things like MSC, a friend of the sea, any of those, you know, how do you feel about organizations that, you know, that have an, a vested interest in, in sustainability? Do you feel like their, their work is actually working or is it kind of too little too late when it comes to, to ocean conservation? They're definitely helping. Um, again, they, they are certain flaws. Um, I'm not going to get into it, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's definitely things that needs to be, um, improved, but again, they're still doing, you know, if they're certified fisheries and they're giving them five years to make the changes and then they're ensuring that those fisheries are making changes. And again, it's still a step forward rather than a step backward. Mm -hmm. But they need to be doing more is kind of what, what you're getting at. Uh, yes, it's, I mean, they're very focused on big fisheries rather than smaller ones. And I think that, again, it's very hard to ask to the family fisheries to pay to get a certification to get a product out, even if it's sustainable. So it's, I just think it's, it's the model is just really made for bigger fisheries rather than smaller ones. And in California, you're kind of lucky because you have a lot of ducks where you can just buy fish, um, local fish. And, you know, that's great for the people who live in like San Francisco, you know, you could walk down yes. to Fisherman's Wharf and pick up your fish. But if you're in Kansas City, you know, you don't mm -hmm. have that option. So, you know, it's it, and, and I think obviously if we look at dietary uh, differences between the San Francisco person versus the Kansas City, you know, you're going to see more meat and and, you know, beef and pork and whatnot in the Midwest, whereas, you know, coastal people are going to eat more fish. So I, I think that's probably a great thing is support your local fisheries, you know, go True. down and, and grab to be fair, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's as, as it should be. I think it's, you know, I think we're just way too used of getting anything we want any time of the year. And I think that it's, it's, it's kind of a wrong mentality that this, this to be able to have access to everything. And I think we need to take a step back a little bit and just go back to respecting seasons and respecting what's available around and really try to, to just live that way again, just respect nature and eat according to, what's available rather than creating a constant demand um, 12 months out of the year. Yeah, forcing it to happen. Great, let's, well, hopefully Amazon doesn't start doing a home fish delivery anytime soon. <laughs> That's gonna destroy us all. I feel like that would be gonna, questionable. It's gonna be delivered by drone and everything. <laughs> right. Your, you know, we actually went out into the ocean, right. plucked, plucked, you know, plucked out a salmon and brought it to your door. The drone drops down a fishing line, just picks up, throws it over. Yeah, it's <laughs> probably not too far off. I wouldn't be surprised. No, seriously. Yeah. Great. You know what? Actually, I'd like to order my fish semen directly from Amazon. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go type that into Amazon when we're done, just to see right. what happens. Yeah. Valentine, what's next for you? What do you, you know, you, you, you've kind of gone through this major life change. You're doing all of this stuff for ocean conservation. You're building, you know, your, shall we say, brand. And, and you know, obviously people are really scope locked on what it is that you're doing. So how do you, what does the next five years of your life look like? Um, I don't know. And I'm happy about that. Um, so, of course, I'm going to keep working on that. And then, you know, I'm going to keep studying as much as I can and try to educate the public as much as possible. And hopefully trying to change the tide a little bit on putting it still a little bit of a burden on a consumer rather than just counting only in fisheries to, uh, to do all the job. And then also I have, um, I just started a Brett Ward company. Oh, cool. Um, to be able just to breed differently. Um, I guess 90% of the population breeds wrong. 
You know, I was actually going to ask about that because if you dive 170 feet into the ocean, you have to prepare yourself physically for that with, with breath work, I'm assuming. And we've, we've gotten a taste of this just with, you know, the Wim Hof method and um, we jump in the cold pool every morning and we definitely recognize the importance of breath. So that, that's fascinating. Can you kind of explain a little bit more about what that is? Yeah. So the Wim Hof is the completely opposite end of the spectrum of what I do. So Wim Hof does hyperventilation. And then again, it's like a short um, immune system boost. And what I do is the opposite. So it's about slowing down your heartbeat as much as possible. Even though a breath hole, um, and then hyperventilation, like with Wim Hof, you're going to feel like you can hold your breath for longer. But this is because what you do is that you're purging all the CO2 out of your body, which means that accumulation of CO2 in your body is what is going to create that urge to breathe. So this is why you feel like uh, you, you can hold your breath longer with that. But it's actually very dangerous in the water because um, the oxygen, when it's attached to uh, hemoglobin, what it has to do is that it needs CO2 to be released. So even if you have more oxygen, it's not released inside of your body anyways. So even though, yes, your urge to breathe is coming up much slower, sadly, the problem is that your oxygen level is going down very, very quickly. And there's well, a danger to... Out. Yes, so there's a danger to blackout. So what I do in the water um, is... I want to slow down my system as much as possible because again, I want to be using as less yeah. oxygen, but actually it's, it's much easier than we think uh, it is because we have a thing called the, the mammalian diet reflex. So pretty much all mammals have it, including like seals and things like that. His wife allowed them to basically um, uh, dive on the water and be able to, uh, to kind of survive while doing that is, when you hold your breath as a human or when you emerge your face and underwater, you're gonna start having change in your body. So your blood is gonna start going from your extremities to your vital organs, your heartbeat is gonna slow down and you, your body kind of gets into sleep mode like a computer. So it's gonna shut down everything that's not necessary for that moment and it's getting ready to hold its breath. So of course it's tricks after that to trigger that, but it's just, we're actually made to do that type of stuff. Interesting. Hmm. So how long can you hold your breath? Five minutes, 45 was my record. What? <laughs> wow. That's insane. Yeah. But again, it's just about, you know, you breathe and then you, you do very, very long exhales because when you inhale, you, you, your heartbeat is going to accelerate and when you exhale, is going to slow down. So this is why you want to have a shorter inhale and a longer exhale. And then the longer you exhale, the, then the more, you're going to relax more and more and more. And then by doing that, you're really shutting everything down and making sure that you're as relaxed as possible. And then you hold your breath and then you just don't move. Gotcha. That's cool. So I can, all right, so where I can, can people find you? Do, you could do a minute and a half, two minutes easy, just like half an hour training. Hmm. Um, where can people find information about your breath work? Uh, so we're just in the final stage of organizing everything and uh, putting everything online soon. It should be online in February, hopefully. So, um, yeah, my Instagram is always the best place to be posted on anything that's happening. Okay. But we do awesome. have an Instagram page, which is called Superhumans Org. Okay. The company is called Superhumans. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll definitely put that in the show notes so we can follow you on your Instagram. We can follow you on Superhumans. And so you're in San Francisco now. Where are you off to next? Um, I'm actually working in San Francisco for a few days and then... After Christmas, I'm, I'm not sure. I'll see. <laughs> You're the Thanks. ultimate nomad. Yes, definitely. Well, COVID, I've kind of, you know, put a little bit of a break in a lot of things, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I uh, know. Normally, we'd be doing this interview in person, but uh, no. So yeah, we, I already got it, so I'm not scared of traveling or anything. You got COVID already? Oh, yeah, I got it in February. Pretty bad. In February, really? Yeah, I was um, in London, actually, and um, I had a fever for about two days, and the scary part is that I had um, a pain lung for about eight weeks after that. A what? I have a pain in the bottom of my lungs for about oh, eight weeks after. Lung pain. Oh, wow. So has that wow. impacted your diving at all? Mm, that's a good question. Nope. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, that, and that's interesting because we hear so much about COVID and pulmonary scarring. So it clearly, you know. It, and just like the long-term effects. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. We're glad you're healthy. Yeah. 
that's um yeah anyways i'm sure um i don't i, I don't want to offend anybody but yeah it's it was it was really bad for me but yeah i still wouldn't want people to lose their restaurants because of it <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's you know, we're, <laughs> look, we we offend every, I offend everybody every single day. That's my <laughs> goal. So you know, you're in the right place. Don't feel sorry about offending people. <laughs> yeah. no, it was it was definitely scary and everything, but you know, it is it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, do you have any other questions? I I think I'm good. Yeah, awesome. I think this is awesome. What about you? No, this is so cool. I can't wait to uh, to share this. I mean, I, you know, we talk so much about ocean conservation, but I, I think you have a front row seat and an integral part in the supply chain of, you know, how do people really source their fish? What does that look like? You know, what does a lifestyle look like where we have to return to almost catch what you, you know, or eat what you kill kind of concept? And, and it, you know, for all the for all of you listeners out there, check out her Instagram page. You can kind of really see this fascinating return to I, I think this this lifestyle that I don't know we've been trying to embrace a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's something beautiful in that. There's something primal in that. There's something very organic in that, and and just a fascinating person to watch. So, uh, Valentine, thank you so much for merci beaucoup. <laughs> of course. Well, I mean, also it was it was my 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 just to finish. It was my my second TED talk. It was Sally Evers in French, but um, yeah, just explain how this disconnection with with kind of the city life and how connecting with nature made me much happier and how I believe that anxiety and all the things would definitely go away if people spend more time outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we need that right now more than anything. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right, Valentine. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank Have you for day. having me. Of thank course, you. Too. Of course. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.